Hello, good evening, and a warm welcome to the News Year in Review from the nation's news authority, ABS. Now, how best to capture the momentous events of 365 days in only 30 minutes? It's not an easy task, right? But this is the most incisive 30-minute recap of 2019 you will ever find. We have identified what we consider the nine biggest stories of 2019. In addition, there will be some stories which will not quite make our countdown, but which deserve special mention as having been impactful and consequential during 2019. Plus, we zoom in on the story which most warmed our hearts during 2019. We also remember those who left us in the year, but whose legacy and contribution will stand the test of time. We're also listing the 10 biggest stories of the second decade of the 21st century. After all, we have just started a new decade, pregnant with possibilities, but which also holds the uncertainty of the unknown. So let's get started. At number nine, the extradition of Leroy King, the former head of the Financial Services Regulatory Commission, the FSRC. After a failed 10-year fight to stave off extradition, the 73-year-old was flown out of the country on an American Airlines flight on the 8th of November. He was taken to this American Airlines plane, a commercial flight, tight security throughout as local law enforcement agencies cooperated with their U.S. colleagues. By now, more and more attention was being placed on the AA aircraft. King's journey to face the U.S. justice system had begun. Lift off shortly after 4.30 Friday afternoon, and as dark clouds quickly obscured the plane from view, King will be hoping for a silver lining. He is facing a 21-count indictment in a Texas court and has been denied bail as he awaits trial for his alleged role in the Allen Stanford multi-billion dollar Ponzi scheme. Stanford is himself serving a 110-year prison sentence. Meanwhile, the U.S. Justice Department has thanked the government of Antigua and Barbuda for its cooperation in the King extradition. At number eight, a nation said farewell to one of its finest sons following an official funeral. Sir Prince Ramsey had touched so many lives and hearts, had towered so large above the nation that his death had created collective lamentation. For moments like this, a picture is worth a thousand words. The viewing of the body of Sir Prince Tuesday morning was, for those gathered here, the final sight of the man whose impact on this country was transcendent. Psalms could be heard at the viewing, silent reflection mostly about a life well lived and a barometer of selfless devotion to the advancement of humanity. Then the moment as the coffin bearing the esteemed son of the soil was carried carefully and clinically to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. Inside, the tributes flowed, starting with Patsy Ramsey, who spoke on behalf of staff at Sir Prince's office. I went to visit him at the hospital, and God had fixed it. And so we were alone in the room, and he stretched out his hands and said to me, hold my hands. And as I held his hand, he put on some tapes, and they were praise and worship songs, and we were there quietly just reveling in the presence of God. It was an awesome time and it was as if we could have felt the very touch of God in that room. And I knew without a doubt that my best friend, that all was well with him. There was a recurring theme throughout the funeral. Sir Prince was not only great, he defined a service to mankind above self. It is with a heavy heart that I say goodbye to this humanitarian, servant master, doctor par excellence, dedicated family man and friend. Rest in peace, my friend. Many have since called for him to be accorded the posthumous honor of national hero. Later in the year, on the day after the anniversary of his birth, the street on which he had lived for decades was named in his honor. On behalf of my sons and family, I would like to thank the government of, the, of Antigua and Barbuda, especially the local government, 
for this honor honor bestowed on my husband. Yesterday was his birthday and he would have been very happy with his gift today. Head of local government office, Carol Lincoln Frederick, said Sir Prince was an extraordinary man. We want to remember a man who was indeed unselfish, a doctor who had a fully patient-centered approach to healthcare and was known to deliver health services to patients at no cost. At number seven, Wendell Robinson was removed from the post of police commissioner after well over a year of being on suspension. The Police Service Commission, the PSC, pulled the plug. The PSC had initially suspended Robinson, citing allegations of sexual harassment against junior male officers. No charges had been brought against him up to the end of the year. Atlee Rodney continues to act in the position of Commissioner of Police. At number six, talk of mega banking deals which are set to provide greater heft to the indigenous banking sector at a time when there is grave concern about the loss of correspondent banking relationships. Now, the Eastern Caribbean Amalgamated Bank, ECAB, is set to acquire the Antiguan operations of Scotiabank and the Antigua Commercial Bank is to acquire the Antiguan operations of the Royal Bank of Canada, RBC. So from an investment standpoint, these consolidations also bring opportunities to investors. Even to the government of Antigua and Barbuda, that is a significant shareholder in ECAP. And again, I just want to reconfirm that there is no need for any precipitous action by anyone, for any anxiety, that everything is running smoothly, and that it will be a seamless operation in the acquisition of these two banks, which will be combined with two indigenous banks, ECAP and ACB. Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce, CIBC, has indicated it has reached a deal to sell two-thirds of its stake in the CIBC First Caribbean to the GNB Financial Group owned by Colombian banking magnate Jaime Galinsky. But the Gaston Brown administration says, not so fast. The government in Antigua and Barbuda wants CIBC to offer the stake in its Antiguan operations to indigenous banks as well. At number five, Is the moment seen all around the world, four Antiguan women rowing into the history books for a lifetime. The atmosphere made all the more powerful by thousands who gathered, appreciative of what Elvira Bell, Crystal Clashing, Samara Emanuel and Kevinia Francis did. Enduring that treacherous 3,000 mile journey from Lagomero to Nelson's Dockyard, where their mind, body and soul were tested for 47 days, 8 hours and 25 minutes. While Antigua is a destination for the other teams that took part in the Telesco Whiskey Atlantic Challenge, Team Antigua was rowing for home. And what a welcome it was. There were tears of joy as family members welcomed the woman who not only overcame the challenge for themselves, but for at-risk young girls who benefit from the Cottage of Hope, their chosen charity. They sent a message that anything is possible, you just have to dream it. They've shown the world what women can do. And for us, it is demonstrative of the resilience, the courage and talent of the Antiguan and Barbudan people. We are certainly very proud of them and I'm quite sure that they will help to inspire further achievements by other Antiguans and Barbudans, especially females, and to further entrench that culture that we're seeking to develop here in Antigua and Barbuda as a can-do people, people who can literally compete globally. And speaking publicly for the first time, the message to the world from the team. Thank you Antigua and Barbuda. Thank you to all the people in the diaspora and to those across the globe who are with us in love and in spirit on our journey. We have been blessed with amazing support from the generosity of our cash and in-kind sponsors and donors to our trainers, volunteers, weather routers, cheerleaders, prayer warriors, families, race organizers, from the school child who looked at us with hope and wonder, to the elders who prayed, to the individuals who never doubted that we could and that we would, to the spirit, tenacity, ingenuity, and legacy of our ancestors. We honor all of you. 
We're moving briskly through our countdown. At number four, the Global Ports deal signed, sealed, delivered. It is managing the cruise piers in St. John's under a 30-year lease agreement. We will realize this agreement the following. One, a U.S. 21 million debt has been paid off from ACB. The government of Antigua and Barbuda will receive one U.S. dollar per passenger for the first three years, and that will increase incrementally from the fourth year, directly to the Treasury. An additional $150 per passenger will be paid to the National Solid Waste Management Authority. Minister Fernandez says this is significant, as in the past, all of the head tax and environmental levy went toward paying the loan at ACB, with nothing remaining for the Treasury or the Environment Department. Other benefits include the financing of a fifth berth, up to 30 million U.S. dollars, to accommodate the Oasis-class cruise ships the largest to sail the oceans. Four, upgrading the present heritage key complex with a minimum of two million US dollars. Five, adding a new commercial area on Lower Newgate Street to include shops and cafes at an investment of over 25 million US. The arrangement will also see Global Ports providing five million dollars US to the new Entrepreneurial Development Fund to assist Antiguans and Barbudans with low-interest loans in the tourism industry. The deal had faced blistering criticisms in some quarters, which spilled over into street protests. But Prime Minister Brown believes those protests were vexatious. I believe that we now have a win-win outcome, one in which all stakeholders will benefit. But at the end of the day, maybe they see it as an opportunity to keep their base active and maybe to get some form of um, recognition that they're doing something but I don't see their protestation bring any real value. At number three, a major milestone for the country's tourism, by far the most important revenue earning sector. Laura and Ian Bowen, a UK couple, makes up the 300,000th and 300,000th and first people to visit Antigua by ear. The pair was treated to music and dance after disembarking Virgin Atlantic. They say how they feel about the welcome. Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely amazing, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, very warm. A short reception was also held at the airport's VIP lounge. Hip, hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip, hip. Hooray! Hip, hip, hip. Hooray! The couple, who is in Antigua for the first time, will be staying at the Sanders Grand Resort. The resort and the Antigua and the Barbuda Tourism Authority have already offered the due and all expenses paid trip back to the island. There's a certificate in the case of one of the first trips we're very, very happy to have reached a milestone. Uh, our Prime Minister has been needling us and saying, when are you going to do 300,000? When are you going to do 300,000? And we kept telling him we are pushing for 2019 to break that uh, glass ceiling. Of course, the problem is now that we're broken it, the Prime Minister says, so when are you going to do 400,000? Number two in our countdown is closely linked to number three because the better tourism does, the better the economy also does. For 2019, growth for uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, starting with Dominica, 9%. Of course, coming on the back of rebuilding following the devastation caused by Hurricane Maria in 2017. Antigua and Barbuda expected to end 2019 with growth of 6.2% in real gross domestic product, meaning real GDP is growth uh, which is accounted for for inflation or adjusted for inflation. So it gives you a sense of the expansion of economic activity without inflation. The Dominican Republic 4.8%, uh, the Guyana 4.5%, Panama 3.5%, rounding out the top five. And for 2020, growth is projected to be even higher, with the country expected to be outpaced only by Guyana, which will have stratospheric levels of growth due to a boom from oil revenues. Guyana is expected to have growth in the region of 85.6%, and Tiga and Barbuda expected to grow by well over 7%. The government itself is also um, investing. You know that Namco has a number of projects that it is investing in, in the car park. We just invested in a judging company. So our model of empowerment capitalism uh, is working, in which the government is partnering with the private sector, helping to stimulate domestic investments uh, and to reduce our reliance on foreign direct investments. Not that foreign direct investments are not important. They are very important. But at the same time, we want to make sure 
that we generate more domestic profits that could be retained within our country's economy. So, time now for number one in our countdown. And by now, perhaps you are guessing what our top story of the year is. Well, if you guessed it is the opening of the Five Islands campus of the University of the West Indies, you are correct. This was easily the headline grabber of 2019 in Antigua and Barbuda. I remember several years ago, I said to the naysayers that the repurposing of the Five Islands facility was a settled matter. With the campus now officially open and its iconic coat of arms adorning the entrance to the facility. And I can't see any sensible person would want to pursue that fight. Uh, those who oppose the establishment of the university obviously have found themselves on the wrong side of history. The Prime Minister was credited for his steadfastness in ensuring Antigua and Barbuda is the home of the fourth landed campus. I wish therefore to express tremendous gratitude to our distinguished Prime Minister who has argued and pushed for this uplifting of his people. So with the campus open, does the opposition United Progressive Party support it? We are Antiguan and Barbudan first, and I will never do anything to stand in the way of the education for Antiguans and Barbudans, or for the OECS for that matter. Have you then, have you then abandoned your concerns regarding the location? Well, there's no point making the point when the university is here. I have discussed with um, Sir Hillary utilizing the very concept that we had in our 2009 manifesto uh, to build out the university. So what will happen is that we will relocate the football field towards the east of the um, university campus, uh, obviously in close proximity, because that will be part of the campus and part of the Five Islands community um, facility. Well, I'm really, 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 really proud to see this small village that a lot of people think used to say that we're behind God, God's back yet we produce a number of great persons. And now that we have this university here, we are going to play a significant role in the development of Antigua and Barbuda. By the end of the year, Principal Professor Stafford A. Griffith told us the first semester was a success, and he's sanguine on the prospects for growth and expansion of the campus in 2020. So those are the nine stories which we have selected as the biggest of the year. But there were others which deserve special mention as well. Antigua and Barbuda has again stood at the vanguard of efforts to rescue regional carrier Liat. Perhaps the biggest of those efforts came when the government borrowed over 15 million US dollars from the Bank of Alba in Venezuela to inject into the beleaguered carrier. We're trying to get a shareholders meeting uh, to discuss that issue, to get the shareholders to agree to the injection and to make a determination as to the price at which we will purchase those shares. If it goes according to plan, Antigua and Barbuda will end up as a majority holder in, in Amliat. And obviously, we will be pursuing a very vigorous restructuring of Liat to place it on the path of viability and sustainability. Crucial discussions are to be held among the shareholder governments in light of this major development. It's another story to watch in 2020. The ongoing probe into what happened to twin girls at the Halberton Hospital in 2004. This story arrested the nation's focus, especially in the last quarter of the year. Guyanese national Kiyoma Hamer believes her twins survived, though she was told she had a spontaneous abortion. It's a story to keep watching in 2020. Meanwhile, former Prime Minister Sir Lester Bryant Bird launched his autobiography called The Comeback Kid, chronicling his personal and political triumphs and travails. My first attempt at entering politics in Barbuda in 1971, I was defeated and I had to come back. <laughs> and Errol Court, I thought he might have shown up here, Errol Court also defeated me, but I came back and I beat him. That is, that those are two comebacks that I can tell you. The Dominique elections dominated headlines not only in the Nature Isle, but all across the region. In the end, Prime Minister Roosevelt Scarry's Dominica Labour Party won by a landslide 18 to 3 margin for a fifth straight win is a fourth straight win for Prime Minister Scarry in that post. New bins were installed throughout St. John's, making for a cleaner city. Before we had uh, plastic drums, that were used at little bins. And uh, just imagine that uh, you come off of a ship and uh, you see a plastic drum that is beaten up. Uh, it looks dirty. It just doesn't fit into the aesthetics that we would like to see in the city. The first concrete house was handed over under the Happy Initiative. To say it made a family in Jennings happy 
is an understatement, perhaps the understatement of the year. So you take this, and I want to say this I deliver on behalf of the Ministry of Social Transformation, uh, my colleague Samantha Marshall, and the government and cabinet of Antigua and Barbuda led by the Honorable Gaston Brown. I want to thank everybody. I don't, I can't call any name, everybody, Raggy, everybody. I'm thanking everybody that donated everything to me, thankfully. ABS was awarded Dominica's second highest honor, the Cicero Award of Honor. ABS was recognized for the station's coverage of the impact of hurricanes David and Maria on the Nature Isle. Now it's time for the most heartwarming story of 2019. Emmanuel Jonathan Howard Segui. That is how this seven-year-old introduces himself to his customers. He sells pumpkins grown from his backyard to anyone who is willing to buy. When people buy my pumpkin, it makes me feel excited. The Golden Grove resident is the last of ten children and with only one brother and the majority sisters. I have eight sisters and not even one helped me plant, plant or sell. Emmanuel has the full support of his parents who are originally from Barbuda. There have also been orders for the food from the sister isle, which he and his father Howard Segui and his mother Aitama delivered through the ferry service. The Mary E. Pickett grade 2 student took me to his backyard where he showed our news team where he reaped the crop he planted about three months ago. But what's the reasoning behind his idea to talk his mom and dad into selling the pumpkins? I wanted to say, sell pumpkin because I wanted to save money to buy a bike. Emmanuel had the opportunity of choosing his bike from popular toy store Neverland, downtown St. John's. The owners of the toy store, like the rest of the country, were captivated by ABS's story of the seven-year-old's work. Emmanuel planted pumpkins and with the help of his parents sold the pumpkins in order to buy a bike for Christmas. Now the Sauds of Neverland were moved by the story and decided to offer Emmanuel a bike of his choice. Neverland proudly sponsored Emmanuel his first bike. We are always encouraging young minds to do the best and I hope all the youngsters learn from Emmanuel. I hope he enjoys his bikes. Emmanuel, with his infectious smile, did not miss his opportunity to give thanks. Thanks, Neverland, to, for donating the bike for me. Sadly, his bicycle was stolen, but his anguish did not last long, as promised to the Honorable Gaston Brown promptly bought him a new one. Time now for the stories which defined the decade just ended. The news in 2010 was dominated by the Haiti earthquake and WikiLeaks. 2011, the killing of Osama bin Laden and the start of the Arab Spring. 2012, the re-election of Barack Obama as a US president. Kim Jong-un rises to power in North Korea. 2013, the Boston Marathon bombing. 2014, the Honorable Gaston Brown becomes Prime Minister in Antigua and Barbuda. 2015, same-sex marriage legalized across the United States. 2016, Donald Trump elected in the US. The United Kingdom votes to leave the European Union. 2017, Irma decimates Barbuda. Maria pounds Dominica. 2018, ABLP re-elected in Antigua and Barbuda. The CCJ rejected in a referendum. 2019, Five Islands Campus of the University of the West Indies opens in Antigua. The Dominica Labour Party also secures a landslide victory in general elections. All right, now it's time for us to remind ourselves of those who left us in 2019. Here is In Memoriam.
Well, we could not end without a chance to laugh at ourselves in the bloopers segment. Although the men were found innocent, they fear their reputation is tarnished. Take two. They say their reputation is tarnished. Although the men were found innocent, they say their reputation is tarnished and fear what that means for their future. Let's write that again. The cost of attending university overseas is one aspect that's made. Uh... Now, the Reparation Support Commission, in collaboration with the Ministry of Culture, will. <laughs> We'll be hosting a Black History Month lecture on Thursday. Thank you for staying here with us on the ABS Evening News. That's it for our year in review. Thanks so much for joining us in 2019 as we covered the stories that mattered for you. 2020 promises more massive stories. Rest assured, we will be first factual and fair in covering them. As always, Happy New Year from all of us here at ABS. I'm Garfield Burford. Good evening.